Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to our ICRN seminar series. Um, it's our great pleasure to welcome Nicholas Schultz today um, to, to the seminar. He's going to be focusing on how we can use our knowledge of genomics and um, CBioPortal to better understand our cancer. His work has been looking at interesting computational methods to assess genomic data sets. Um, he's been very involved in the TCGA, um, in the Genie Project. Um, and I think this is a really important tool for us as both clinical and translational investigators to better understand. Um, and so thank you so much for, for coming and helping us understand what, uh, what options we have to use this really powerful tool. Great. Uh, thank you, Nilo, and uh, thank you for, for having me here. Um, let me share my screen and remove some controls. So yeah, I wanted to introduce everybody to um, the CBIO portal for, for cancer genomics. Um, I guess as a, as a first question, I wanted to get a sense for how many people have used um, a CBIO portal before? And I think Rick has a, a poll ready to go that should show up on your screen now where you can answer to simply yes or no whether you've used the, the portal before. And I mean, maybe you've heard about it but haven't used it. I want to get a sense for basically how advanced people already are. Um, I think maybe, I don't know, this probably doesn't have to be, do you already see responses? Yep, coming? we have about. About 80% of, every, uh, of everybody oh. has So I'm gonna give it another five seconds. Okay, good, awesome. Okay, good. So 20% have uh, have used it before, 80% have not. So that's good, that, that, that allows me to basically adjust my pace. So I apologize to those 20% who might be more advanced. Um, but hopefully you'll get an advanced feature uh, out of it here or there. So I'll try to, to, to keep it a little bit more, more basic then to really uh, introduce you to the main idea and then also point you towards resources that you can use to, um, to learn more about it. Um, so this, the CBIO portal is now in, I think it's 12th year of existence. We started building it um, in the very early days of the Cancer Genome Atlas when um, we realized that there was going to be a, a huge divide between like piles and piles of data that um, comes off the sequencers um, and is uh, probably inaccessible to most people because it sits in text files or um, the spreadsheets. And then researchers and oncologists on the other side who really would love to be able to interpret these data, but there's just going to be too much of a technical barrier. Just um, there's only so much you can do in a spreadsheet or uh, in, in in Excel to analyze. And the first project we were working on was a glioblastoma project. The very first iteration, I think, contained only 91 sequenced or analyzed samples with sequence mutation information on just 600 genes. But it already included mute, uh, copy number data. Uh, mRNA expression levels, DNA methylation levels, microRNAs, and then clinical annotation about these samples. And it was clear that if this is just the beginning, we're going to have a big problem later on um, with uh, making that data accessible. And um, so my own personal background is that I'm a molecular biologist, someone who started at the bench, uh, did, did a lot of molecular bio biology research, but then always had an interest in and uh, in, in computers in general. And uh, for my postdoc, I tried to transition to a more computational um, role and try to learn computational methods. But that put me in this position that I sort of understood how, uh, what kind of questions uh, a cancer genomicist or a molecular biologist would like to answer and what kind of tools they might need um, to, to answer those questions. And in some sense, I was one of those users and I teamed up with a software engineer in the lab and we started building CBIO portal. And, um, now, 12 years later, it's, it's, it's grown into um, a, a fairly successful project that really connects uh, people to data and allows them to, to um, explore data visually uh, and analyze data through explorative, uh, iterative explorative analysis. And I think we succeeded uh, by, uh, mainly by making the, the interface intuitive, um, having the system be fairly quick and of course, that's now with the ever-growing data sets, 
that is a, ch a challenge that we need to address. Uh, and we try to reduce the, the complexity of the data. Uh, what, what is billions and billions of, of, of DNA uh, base calls can, if you do it right, be called into, can be uh, converted into what we call event calls. Is my gene of interest altered or not? Either by a mutation or by a focal copy number change or even epigenetic silencing or just unexplained, unexplained upregulation or downregulation, and then layer on top of that the relevant clinical information, and you can gain a lot of insights by, by using CBIO portal. Uh, one important piece of information is that the CBIO portal uh, code is open source, uh, and all the data that we have collected is, is open as well. Um, so if um, we maintain a, a public instance of CBIO portal that, that people can use, but anybody who is interested in putting local uh, data into there, uh, into using CBIO portal locally with the right kind of technical skills, uh, you can set up a local instance, uh, feed your own local data into it. Um, so we license this under an open source license called AGPL um, and um, work in a, in a large team consisting of Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber, um, Princess Margaret in Toronto, CHOP in Philadelphia, and then a small company in the Netherlands called The Hive that's really specialized in, in open source software. And together we maintain the code, but we also get contributions from others. And as a result, the code is used by probably uh, hundreds of people for local installations, not just academic centers and hospitals, but also um, companies who use it for their internal research and feed their own internal data into it. Um, this just shows you the number of daily visits to our, our public site. Um, still increasing, um, and then the number of annual citations of, of our paper also still increasing, more and more citations every year, um, just to, to illustrate that the people are actually using it and we've, we've gained some critical mass now to, to in some traction to, to make it even better. Um, another system that I'm going to, going to talk about briefly or show, most of this talk is going to be a, a live demo of the system and I can uh, you guys can guide me with questions uh, uh, as well, and I can I can try to answer them throughout the, the talk. But another component that I will briefly mention, and if there are questions about it, I can show more is is Onco KB, which is um, a knowledge base that we're developing at MSK uh, to capture the effects of specific mutations found in tumor samples. And the challenge here is that not every mutation you find in a cancer sample is driving that tumor even if it is in a known, in a well-known cancer gene. You really have to look at the exact allele that is altered and how it's altered to understand um, whether or not that mutation is, is functional. And then on top of that, <clears throat> you want to know whether or not that, that mutation might sensitize the patient to a specific drug. Um, and, and at the drug level, we, we distinguish between different levels where level one uh, are FDA approved drugs uh, as biomarkers for um, treatment with a specific drug in a specific um, tumor type. Level two is not quite FDA recognized, but clearly listed in the NCCN guidelines. And then levels three and four are those that are in investigational use. Level three are those that are in clinical trials that have already shown promising results. And level four is a level below where um, there's preclinical evidence or sort of anecdotal case-by-case uh, -case evidence of sensitivity. Then we have a couple of resistance levels as well. And all together we have annotations in OncoKB for close to 700 genes. We have manually annotated more than 5,000 alterations and have drug implications uh, covering 96 drugs in 56 tumor types. So cholangiocarcinoma, of course, is, is not one of the most uh, common cancer types. And as a consequence, it is underrepresented in CBIO portal. And this shows you on the left, the more common cancer types in, in CBIO portal. So not surprisingly, there's a lot of breast cancer, prostate cancer, um, lung cancer, and many others. And if you look for cholangiocarcinoma, there aren't that many studies yet. We are trying to change that now. And we're uh, with the support from the cholangiocarcinoma foundation, we are um, we're sort of eyeing data sets that we can integrate. <clears throat> and here's a list of of all the studies that we are aware of. If there are others out there with publicly available data, please let us know and we're, we're happy to add them to the list. So at the top here, we have the studies that are already in CBIO portal and at the bottom, 
you have um, a, a list of studies that are either already published or about to be published, like this one by Thomas Berner et al. at MSK, uh, that's going to include 412 um, samples with some clinical annotation. And altogether, if we if we succeed at collecting them all, uh, we're going to be at 1,870 um, samples from cholangiocarcinoma. And what is what's not shown here, and I'll, uh, I can I'll show that in the examples. We we have samples that are included in the AACR project Genie. Uh, project, which I'll introduce by just showing the website. Uh, and then we also have cell lines from CCLE that we can take a closer look at, uh, and then uh, uh, drug sensitivity data from cholangiocarcinoma uh, cell, uh, cell lines included in DEPMAP that we would also like to include. And I think with, with that, I can start um, actually just showing some of the features of CBioPortal through a live demo. And I think um, you can, I don't know how we want to handle this. You can probably, you can probably ask questions in the, in the chat. Um, and I would then be happy to, to answer them live as well. Um, so maybe I'll start with, so CBioPortal is a web-based um, system that we've, we, I think it's probably optimized for, for Google Chrome. It works well in, in Firefox and in Safari, but we can't really support Internet Explorer anymore. Um, so if you can use Chrome, that way you're the closest to what we're using. Um, so the public site is, that I mentioned is at cbioportal.org. Um, and the, the interface at the beginning is a little uh, probably challenging mainly because we use it to list all the different um, uh, studies that we have um, either uh, in, in list format grouped by, um, by organ system or you can also uh, find your studies based on the organ system. So you can, for example, um, click on liver or kidney uh, here and, and, and find your studies, or you can simply use the search feature and for example, type in uh, any, any keyword or subset of it, like cholangiocarcinoma, and now you'll see the available studies. And that basically matches what I, what I showed earlier. And you can look at these studies uh, one by one or in combination, and I'll, I'll try to show some of that later. Then the other um, data set that we, we have is in another portal, and I'll show you how to get there, um, that we are maintaining for ACR Project Genie. Um, it doesn't look much different from, from, from the other portal, but the, the key study here is the Genie cohort version 8.1 public, which is 95,000 samples. Um, I have a, I have some, let me move these. Um, I have some, I have this, this subset here prepared, which are 406 samples um, from the cholangio, that are cholangiocarcinoma and that are in this study. And I think with this, um, I can jump a little bit into the, the CBIO portal features. So. What the, what the study view is showing you is, is basically how, uh, what the genomic and clinical characteristics are of these 406 selected samples. Um, the first plot here just shows you each dot is a tumor sample, how many mutations are in each sample versus uh, what the degree of, of copy number changes are. So you can see cholangiocarcinoma in general is characterized by varying degrees of DNA copy number changes. Some have a lot, some have uh, have few, like the ones here in the in the corner, and some of them are overlapping samples. Um, and then a subset, relatively small number of samples, is hypermutated. There's one sample here that is uh, has 63 mutations. What you have to keep in mind here is that these are um, Pan, these are data from panel sequencing. So 468 sequence genes in the case of MSK. So that's a lot of mutations for just 468 um, genes. And a couple here have, have 30 or so mutations. And you get an overview of the mutated genes. And if you know a little bit about um, cholangiocarcinoma genomics, then of course you recognize the main players here. So we have 23% of our tumors have an IDH1 mutation, 18.5% of the P33 mutation, and then ARID1A, BAP1, PBRM1, the next batch, and you have IDH2 at, at 5%. And you can see that um, there are few genes that are frequently mutated, but a lot of genes that are 
uh, rarely mutated. Not all of them, of course, are drivers driving this disease, and that's a that's that's a challenge that we can we can we were trying to address with different tools, and I'll show you a couple of them later. Uh, then, of course, um, FGFR2 fusions are common in uh, cholangiocarcinoma, and the MSK impact assay that is underlying these data here includes the ability to to capture those fusions, and we see them in. 13.8%, 71 samples have an FGFR fusion. The other fusions that are listed here are often simply rearrangements that involve um, tumor suppressor genes. So for example, CDKN2A uh, is involved in four different gene fusions or gene rearrangements. And that's probably not surprising because as you scroll down here, you can see that CDKN2A is also the most frequently deleted gene in cholangiocarcinoma deleted in 12% uh, of, of tumor samples, um, together with the gene that's sitting right next to it, CDKN2B. And there aren't really any other like frequent deletions. The next one is BAP1, but there are quite a few, there are amplifications at about the two to 3% level, including MCL1 on chromosome 1Q, cyclin D1 and the FGF3-4 uh, locus on chromosome 11Q, and an MDM2 is next. Um, the Genie data does not currently contain a lot of clinical annotation. That is something that Genie is trying to change. But for now, uh, there's information about sex, ethnicity, um, the sample type, whether it's a primary or metastatic sample, um, and then the primary race of, of the patient. And the rest is, is genomic characteristics, including the age at which the, the patient was sequenced, which is uh, showing an average of about 60 to 65 here and then the rest is, is mutation data. Um, you can now look at this more closely and say, okay, I'm interested in this cohort and I want to know more about my, these more frequently mutated genes, for example. I also want to add FGFR2 and then from the copy number of all the genes, I want to add CDKN2A. Those are all added up here. If you want, you can add additional genes, for example, I don't know, FGFR1, just because you're interested in, you didn't see it in the list because it was too far down, but you can add it here. And then you can hit query. Once you hit query, the CBIO portal puts you into a different mode where it still looks at the cohort, but it's looking in much more, uh, uh, with much more detail now at the uh, specific genes that, that you have requested to look at in exactly <clears throat> the order that you, you asked to look at. And it's telling you at the, in the top right corner that um, you've queried 406 samples from 390 patients. And out of those, 80% of patients and samples have at least one alteration in those genes, one somatic genomic alteration in this case. Uh, and by default, the CBIO portal considers the following events as um, alterations. They are, they are all um, somatic mutations that, are, that, are, um, that change the, the coding sequence, so non-synonymous mutations. Those could be uh, in green missense variants, or they could be so the, the green squares here are missense variants. So sorry, one step back. Patients are shown from left to right. And there are, like I said, um, uh, 390 um, each. And then genes are shown from top to bottom. So each, um, each column is a patient. And what you can hear, see in this view is basically how the tumors of these patients are altered by the genes that you've queried and the overlap between the genes. So IDH1 is altered in 22%, mostly by missense mutations, or exclusively by missense mutations. Uh, there are a couple of the black squares here are truncating mutations, which affect TP53, TP53 and some of the other tumor suppressors. The brown ones are in-frame insertions or deletions, which affect P53 and some other genes. Um, then we have the blue taller rectangles are the deletions, so CDKN2A was the most frequently deleted genes, and together with mutations and fusions, it's actually altered in 15%. Um, and then amplifications are, sh are shown in, in um, red, and they affect um, FGFR2 and KRAS in this example, and the fusions are shown in purple. And you can imagine these, these can actually be overlaid, uh, so you can have samples that have mutations and copy number changes in the same sample and or even a, mut a copy number change of fusion and a mutation. You can see them all on top of each other. So this is the, the, the overview. You can now play around with the genes, change their order, and you can begin to see things that, of course, if you know the data, you are familiar with. For example, the fact that IDH1 mutations and FGFR2 um, 
fusions and mutations tend to be mutually exclusive. So the 22% and the 19% have little overlap. There are three samples over here that have overlap. You can zoom in a little bit more if you want to see more details and then you can pan around like this. So there are three samples here that have both an IDH1 mutation and an FGFR2 fusion or mutation. Um, if you want to bring F FGFR1 up here in addition, you can do that. FGFR1 doesn't seem to be all that interesting. Um, one nice, uh, one, one feature that I mentioned earlier is the integration of OncoKB. Um, and I, I'll come back to it. I just want to show you here real quick the difference between all of these mutations, which show up in dark green, and this one here, which shows up in light green, is simply the fact that um, the dark green ones are mutations that we know or think are driver mutations in, in cancer. And the light green ones are variants of unknown significance where we don't know whether they're driver, but they are possibly just passenger variants. And you can see that in, the, in this graph by uh, the, the color distinction where uh, anything that is a dark color is a more likely driver. And anything that's, a, um, that's in light green is a, a potential, is a variant of unknown significance, potentially a passenger. And this potentially a passenger really depends a lot on the cancer type you're looking at. Um, cholangiocarcinoma is, is one with a relatively low mutation burden. So more of those VUSs are potentially drivers. And I can talk about FGFR2 in a second. Um, but uh, I mentioned earlier that a couple of tumors have a relatively high mutation count. You can, you can add that as a track here in the Oncoprint. You can add additional tracks too. Like if you want to add sex, for example, you can add it as well. And you can really um, customize this, this Oncoprint. Um, but so you can now take a closer look at some of these missense mutations and figure out up here whether or not they occur in the context of higher mutation burden. So interestingly, you can immediately see that maybe these P53 mutations occur in the context of higher TMB, while the FGFR fusions occur in the context of lower TMB. So those things are already visible here. You can customize this further. And if you want to, for example, sort this on print by, by sex, you can now make a, a female versus male oncoprint um, and maybe quickly visually look at differences. You can do that in other ways more systematically uh, as well, but I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to get to that. Um, another very important tab is the mutations tab. Um, and this summarizes per gene now where in the gene mutations are found. So not surprisingly, IDH1, um, which has 94 mutations, has, they're all but, all but one are in this one locus at R132. Um, and there's one over here that is not. The ones that are at R132, which I can select here, um, you can, at the bottom here, you get a, a tabular view of the mutations. You can see the sample ID of the, of the patient, the actual protein change, we have this annotation column where we bring in uh, different annotation sources to tell us about what the mutation does. In this case, uh, OncoKB will tell you that it's an oncogenic variant, that biologically it's a switch of function. And here are two papers that support this, this, um, uh, uh, this assessment. Uh, and then, sorry, uh, and then you can see that, <clears throat> you can see a brief summary of, ID, of IDH1, that the mutation is known to be oncogenic, and that there is clinical data that um, cholangiocarcinoma treated with uh, evocidinib evo um, are sensitive to uh, respond uh, when, when they have this mutation. And you can see here that we have a, a reference for that as well. So since this is not an FDA approved or NCCN guideline listed treatment yet, it's, we have it as level 3A, which is compelling clinical evidence. And uh, we also have annotation from, from other sources such as Civic, My Cancer Genome, and then Cancer Hotspots, which is simply um, a recurrence-based method that tells you whether or not a particular amino acid is mutated more frequently than you would expect by chance in large collections of, of tumor samples. <clears throat> so you can look at R132 and you, in this case, you get, you find out what you probably already know, but you can look at this one here, this one lone N349S mutation, uh, which is, according to OncoKB, a variant of unknown significance, right? Uh, the significance is unknown, 
therefore it's shown as light green in the oncoprint and not annotated in this view in this table with a um, with the blue bullseye that all the other ones have. <clears throat> if you want to, if you're still curious, this might still be functional, even though it's never been seen before. It's also not in the cosmic database. Otherwise, there would be a number here, as there is for um, for for the R132, which is in cosmic almost 5,000 times. Um, you can get more information about the variant allele frequency in this particular tumor sample. It was the, the mutation supported by 88 reads out of 772 total. Um, and you can even look at the 3D structure. So if, if you're interested in looking at this mutation, you can, sometimes it's a little finicky, so I can select it here and it shows up in yellow here. So it's over here in the 3D structure and you can hold down the shift key and click the other mutation. And now you see R132 is here, not anywhere near uh, the other, other mutations. So that could give you additional information about maybe these two mutations are close to each other in space and could be related. In this case, not. Um, you can click to another gene here, FGFR2, which has a slightly more interesting mutation spectrum. Uh, it has obviously all the fusions, which we still list in this view here, 71 fusions. They're not annotated up here, but everything else is. So if I click select all the other ones, you can see the missense and the in-frame mutations where they fall. So we have one little hotspot here uh, at C382, which um, are annotated as um, drivers, hence the blue bullseye, and are also annotated as level four sensitivity for all tumor types to a couple of different um, uh, FGFR, FGFR inhibitors. And if you look at the bottom here, you can see a couple of mutations that we don't have annotated as, as potential drivers, including one at 654 in the tires and kinase domain. OncoKB does not know about it. And it was last officially reviewed in 2017. I don't think that there's a paper about this one yet, but if there were and you knew about it, you could click um, this little feedback link here uh, and tell us about it. And we would, we would just take your feedback into account, ideally with a PubMed reference, but not even needed. And we would annotate that variant so that in the future, it will look up, uh, it'll, it'll show up. And what's fairly suspicious here, if you look at the in-frame events, there are two that we have annotated as drivers. It's these two. Uh, these, uh, it's actually, yeah, so this one is not annotated as a driver, but I'd be surprised if this is not just given the, the location and the fact that it's an in-frame deletion, this must be a driver. We just don't have in OncoKB any either statistical or actual publications, uh, no evidence that this is a, a known driver. We have to probably, uh, we were, we we're waiting for the paper that basically describes this variant or this one for that matter. <clears throat> so we might, we might be a little behind. Um, yeah, and you can do this for, for all the other genes. Um, you can look at, the mutual exclusivity, which will quickly tell you for each gene pair whether or not the pattern and alterations that you see is mutually exclusive, has a tendency towards mutual exclusivity or co-occurrence, and whether or not that is statistically significant with the p-value and the q-value. Um, and there are lots of other lots of other things you can do. And depending on the data availability, you, you may be able to do less or more. Um, I wanted to show one one more example. And then maybe we can start even taking taking questions, or maybe I'll show show two more. I'll, I'll actually switch to the public C bio portal that we looked at earlier, um, just to show you one. Um, so you can focus on one cancer type, but sometimes you actually want to uh, look at your one cancer type in the context of others. And one really good way of doing that is by using the the TCGA Pan Cancer Atlas studies, which we have pre-selected here. So you can click on those. Now the portal has selected 32 and you can say query by gene um, uh, and type in any gene you're interested in. So I'm gonna just do FGFR2, given that it's a cholangiocarcinoma gene and you want to know <clears throat> how FGFR2 alterations in cholangiocarcinoma compare to other cancer types. Unfortunately, uh, cholangiocarcinoma is underrepresented within the TCGA as well, where while most TCGA projects aim to sequence 
about 500 tumor samples. Cholangiocarcinoma was always considered as one of the rare cancer types, which, in which I think the goal was uh, about 50 samples. For some reason, uh, we only have 30 some in, in the portal. But this view already is, is useful here. So it's basically showing you across all the different TCGA covered cancer types, how frequently is FGFR2 altered? Um, and even though you only have um, 36 cases here in TCGA, you can see that cholangiocarcinoma is the cancer type with the highest alteration rate, close to 20, where the majority of them are fusions, but a subset are um, uh, uh, mutations in green. Fusions purple, uh, mutations green. Next one is uterine. Um, uh, uterine cancers where it's 18% uh, or so. And then you can see it drops down quickly and some cancer types have, have almost no alterations. And you can also see that the types of alterations so that the fusions are really a cholangiocarcinoma dominant thing. Well, in some cancer types you see them, but, but, but they're not very common outside of cholangio. You can look at the mutation spectrum as well. And these are now all the cholangiocarcinoma, uh, sorry, all the FGFR2 mutations across all cancer types. And you can imagine with like the way mutations work, the random, the random effects uh, on the genome and they require, the, there's positive selection for them, but a lot of them are also just passenger events that are along for the ride. And if you sequence enough tumor samples, eventually you'll get every amino acid of the genome, of, the, of, of, of your gene of interest mutated, especially in a gene that is not essential and where there's no negative selection like, like FGFR2 probably is. But you can see clear hotspots here, yes, like the S252W uh, uh, mutation, which is an, <coughs> a, a uterine mutation. Um, you can see this hotspot here in the kinase domain, which is, which is another uterine mutation. You can show all, you can quickly, well, for example, if you just want to see the cholangia, there are only two mutations right now, but these would be, this would be your cholangia spectrum. If you wanted to see the uterine, these are all the uterine mutations. And if you wanted to see some random mutations, probably melanoma is a good example, like high, mut high background mutation burden, lots of mutations that we don't think do much with three exceptions, right? Three mutations here are annotated as, um, as potential drivers. The rest are, are passengers. Um, and then maybe the last thing I wanted to show here was um, the, the plots tab, which now will allow you to um, look at different associations between even expression, copy number changes, mutations. But the one that I want to highlight is, and it's always going to show up if you do a TCGA pan cancer link, there's always going to be this mRNA versus study link, which now shows you for each gene or for each gene in your query, and in this case, I only have one in the query, I would be able to switch it here. Uh, what the expression levels are across the cohort in each study. Um, and I can, right now they're sorted alphabetically, so you can find cholangiocarcinoma alphabetically, and you can see it's fairly high on average. So each dot is a tumor sample that was profiled, and the y-axis shows you the expression level of FGFR2 in that sample. And you can see basically how, and it's a log two scale from RNA-seq read counts, so you can, so these are very high levels. And, at the bottom here, this is basically no expression at the bottom. And you can sort those by median expression levels, where now on the right, you're going to have your tumor types with the highest expressions. On the left, you're going to have tumors with almost no expression. So AML and melanoma have very low levels of expression. But actually, cholangiocarcinoma, on average, is the, the tumor type with the highest expression. Interestingly, the, the fusion positive samples, which you can see here in purple, don't necessarily have much higher levels of expression, which I find, find curious. But if you look at um, breast and uh, esophageal, or actually um, the systemic, you can see some of the tumors with the highest expression overall are those that are amplified. They're amplified, basically they have gene amplifications of FGFR2 in either breast or stomach cancer. And those are the ones that are at the very top here. But um, so you can use this tool for any gene to basically assess, oh, how, how high is the expression of my gene in in which cancer type, and how, is that how does that compare to other cancer types? Um, but maybe I can take some questions now so you can guide me a little bit as to what, what you would like to be shown, like, or, um, and maybe while, um, while I wait for questions, one more thing that I want, needed to show is 
if you want to learn more about the portal, if this, if you find this intriguing and you just really want to know how to do certain things, and I'll, I'll get to more of them throughout this tutorial. We we have a couple of uh, webinars that we ran. This is partly motivated by the whole COVID situation with people sitting at home like me right now with construction next door. Um, so we 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 decided to run a webinar series that we um, where we organize it in five different sessions on five different topics, sort of digging deeper and deeper into the portal. All of those are available on YouTube uh, for you to view They're about an hour in length each uh, with basically they're mainly live demos showing you all the different features. And we have a couple of tutorial slides that, that are available as well. Um, but I recommend that you look at those. Do we have any questions or should I keep showing things? So Dr. Schultz, this is Nilo Azad. I have a, a few questions, but first I wanted to, to thank you for a couple of things. Of course, first for, for coming and giving this fantastic talk. And secondly, for just the leadership and developing CBioPortal. I mean, this is, I feel like so many times in science, we talk about things that are needed or tools that are needed, but then nobody has the gumption to actually put that tool together. And you and your team over the last decade has really shown um, you know how to put put things together in ways that really work and transform the landscape so um all of us are very thankful for this um thank you my question to you is about the annotation so if you look at any report of how publications have increased they're increasing exponentially year by year and especially publications that are involving genomic data and so i was just curious about as this volume goes up what has like what what has your experience been in the last ten years as you tried to keep these data annotated, and what what plans or con or challenges do you think are going to come up as more and more of this data is is available? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I guess we we see several challenges, and I'm going to be brave now, and I'm going to show you uh, what I didn't show earlier because I was worried that it would just take too long. So if you go to the Gini study. Uh, that version 8.1 release is now over 8,000 um, samples large. I think some of this is sort of pre-cached, uh, so it might load a little uh, faster than it would for you if you were to go to the Genie side of it for the first time. So I think one, one part of the answer is simply scale. There's going to be so much data that um, will get more and more difficult to handle. And you can see how like it's loading fairly quickly, but it's 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 taking its time. So 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 scale is is one thing, and then I think the other thing that's important to consider is that TCGA was a project that looked at mainly primary untreated cancer, um, and depending on the disease, primary tumors can be fairly benign and they don't necessarily kill people kill patients, but metastatic disease often does um, and we haven't we're just really beginning to look at the mutations in metastatic disease so that means everything we have in onco kb um, not everything but a lot of what we have in onco kb on a on a given gene might be um might be um skewed towards what we know from primary disease and do we really know already what kind of mutations and i'm just looking at egfr as a commonly drugged gene in lung cancer. Do we really know, like L8, L858R we know is a, a gene that sensitizes to specific drugs. T790M, which is, I think this one, um, um, is, is, is a mutation that is a resistance mutation that uh, occurs in patients treated with a lot in it. Um, do we really know all of these um, um, mut mutations yet? Um, and um, uh, I'll show you, I'll give you a preview of, so Jeannie is in this next phase already. Um, a preview of that I can give you is basically, um, we're going to be uh, profiling more and more tumors longitudinally, and we're going to connect that longitudinal sequencing more and more to uh, drug treatments. So this, the next phase of Jeannie, and this will be will be rolled out starting next November, I believe, officially, is, is uh, what's called the Biopharma Consortium. These are, this is a study that is sponsored by 10 pharma companies. I believe each of them have contributed $4 million towards the 
simple abstraction of clinical data about patients uh, from patients. Um, and I'll just show you an, a representative example here of, or maybe a couple of examples of lung cancer patients that were um, profiled multiple times. So most of the cohort will be patients with a single, um, single sequence patients, but uh, a, a pretty large uh, a subset of them will be patients that have multiple tumors profiled and that will have a lot of treatment information. So here's an example of um, a, non -small, a, a man with a male with non-small cell lung cancer who um, was whose tumor was f first sequenced. Um, the first tumor sample included a, an EGFR indel, which sensitizes to several different EGFR inhibitors. So the patient was uh, was treated with erlotinib. And so you see the timeline here, the first year received erlotinib. You can see here all these little colored dots indicate, and this is part of what was abstracted for these patients, indica indicates whether or not the tumors responded to the treatment. Green means um, either improvement or response. And then red means growth of the tumor or progression of disease or worsening. So you can see the patient responded for a little bit but then quickly started uh, no longer to respond. Eventually, um, we have another sequencing uh, report here that, um, let's see, didn't prepare this one, had that in which you've, uh, they found an EGFR T790M mutation, which is a resistance marker for a lot of nipjafitinib and fatinib, but still sensitizes to osimertinib and uh, therefore the patient was switched to osimertinib actually in combination with crizotinib for some reason. So you can see the complexity here and then responded for a while. Uh, gray means mixed, meaning some lesions responded, some didn't. And then eventually, I guess, disease worsened and the, the tumor was sequenced again. The patient was switched to a different treatment again. So this kind of data, I think, is, is what we're expecting to get more and more of, which then means we might actually be dealing with completely new mutations, a lot more resistance mutations. I think those are now known to show up in, in cholangiocarcinoma patients that are developing resistance to FGFR inhibitors. We're beginning to see new FGFR2 in, um, resistance mutations. Those need to be characterized and they need to be put into systems like OncoKB. So I think even though we've been at it for, um, for over a decade now, I almost feel like we're just starting um, and, and there's so much more to explore, so much more to do and so many more mutations to, um, to characterize, to discover, if that makes sense. Uh, so I see a question here about gene expression queries, whether those are limited to genes in an MSK panel. Uh, no, so actually the, the, the opposite. So if you, if you go back to this, the public CBIO portal, what, what makes the TCGA cohort so unique is the fact that not only are they exome sequenced, meaning every exon of every, every gene was sequenced, every coding gene or every coding exon of every coding gene, but also we have copy number arrays that cover DNA, uh, DNA copy number events. Um, so I can maybe show some examples here, TCG, ovarian. Um, I'll just use for simplicity the published cohort. I'm just going to do very simple. Simple query. Um, so the TCGA includes basically the entire exome plus expression levels plus DNA methylation changes, all of which are to some degree accessible in CBIO portal. Um, so you can go on the on the plots tab once you run an, a query against ovarian cancer uh, cancer samples. You can go on the plots tab uh, and look for um, DNA methylation. Of BRCA1. So for example, with just you saw I did two clicks, I could have actually just clicked on this pre this example link mRNA versus methylation. So for BRCA1, you can very quickly see that in this case, each tumor is a sample. 
is, 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 is a dot here. The y-axis is the mRNA expression. The x-axis is the methylation level of that sample. And you can clearly see that tumors that have higher levels of methylation also have lower levels of mRNA expression. And you can also, with this view, see the nice mutual exclusivity between epigenetic silencing, which is this bubble here, and then the other part of the, 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 the tumor samples in which you see all the mutations, which are shown by the colored, the dark colored dots. Those are all the mutations that occur. So tumors tend to be either inactivated by mutation or by epigenetic silencing. But if you switch to um, a gene like cyclin E1, and you, you can obviously see there's no methylation at play here, but um, you can, um, using this pre uh, quick link here. Actually, let me go to KRAS. Oh, okay, that's, a, that's something I think we need to change. Sorry, confused myself. <laughs> so let's go, let's go back this way. Okay, so if you're looking at this now, now you're looking at um, KRAS copy number levels and KRAS expression levels. So when KRAS is amplified, the expression level is much higher than in samples that are just gained, which are usually broader events, not at as high an amplitude, or just diploid. And then even you can even see the opposite when you lose a copy of KRAS for whatever reason, you see lower expression. So this is um, this this is evident in 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 many genes, but not in all. But you can use the TCGA data to study that. And unfortunately, again, cholangiocarcinoma has has only uh, 50 or even 36 samples, depending on the study we're looking at, but um, you might be able to get something out of it for that. MSK impact, on the other hand, does not have any expression level. Um, there are there are lots of studies that we have published from, from MSK that include MSK impact study data, but this one is probably the biggest one currently uh, outside of Genie. This one comes with a little bit of clinical data as well, but those are only 268 genes in the late this iteration that are covered. There was a question of surrounding normal tissues. So we don't have surrounding normal tissue data in CBioport. So I guess there's, there's two questions here. So Surrounding normal might, to me, implies it's from the same patients. What we are working on adding is normal tissue from um, not adjacent normal tissue or even normal tissue from healthy patients as a control group. Uh, and we envision to add those into CBIO portal so that they would show up even in plots like this. You could imagine this plot showing you all the tumor samples the way they're shown now. And then right next to it, you could imagine You could imagine the normal expression showing up in a separate box plot right next to it. Um, that's something we're working on, and that is available for for TCGA samples in a limited fashion, uh, meaning not not the 500 breast cancer samples, but if they're 500 breasts, there would be probably 50 normals. Is there a simple way to assess tumor cellularity? Um, there's currently no no simple way, uh, but there are a couple of ways to to get there. Um, so let me think of a, a good example. So ideally, ideally, if if a co if 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 as part of a cohort you have a tumor cellularity measure assigned to a sample, that would show up on the study view just like all these other um, other graphs here. So you could imagine uh, another chart showing up here. And these are, I'm just loading up all the um, available data here. That is, that would be called tumor cellularity. You would add it and it would show you a distribution of, of tumor cellular cellularities or I guess purities or, um, um, and, and then you would, you, would, you would be able to look at that. Um, I'll show you another example. Sometimes the, the information available about it uh, in, in these samples could help you. So for example, I'm gonna just go back to an example that I know pretty well. If you look at 
the endometrial uh, cancer publication from TCGA in, and you look at KRAS and NRAS, you would expect them to be mutually exclusive across the cohort, um, which, because they activate the same process and why would a, a given tumor cell have both of these processes activated? There's really no good explanation for why the second event would provide an additional selective advantage. So we have two exceptions here. So if you look at KRAS and NRAS, the majority of the NRAS alterations occur in tumors that don't have a KRAS alteration. The two exceptions. One of them is a, is a case where you have a KRAS 176Q mutation that coexists with a NRAS truncating mutations. In this case, I believe both of them are passengers and they probably occur in the context of, of hypermutation. You can add that here and you can quickly see, oh yeah, this occurs in a tumor with 7,000 mutations in 20,000 sequence genes. But then this case here is interesting because it has a KRAS G12D, which is known activating, and an NRAS Q61, which is also known activating. If you click on that ID, it takes you to the, 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 the sample view, a patient view for that particular patient, which for TCGA includes the original pathology report, properly de-identified, but even uh, histology tissue images, which are accessible in, in the browser and you can zoom in, go all the way down to the, the cell level. This one doesn't look like, like it's very good, but um, most of them look better. But back to the summary, now you can look at um, each mutation comes with an allele frequency. So you can imagine in a, in a heterozygous mutation, uh, you have a 50% allele frequency if the tumor is pure and there's no stroma and the tumor is clonal then everything would be at 50%. As the two, and, and, and actually all, in this particular tumor, we're looking at 208 mutations. And if you just plot the distribution of the variant allele frequencies, you actually see a peak near 0.5. If the tumor were less pure, that peak would shift towards 0 0.4, 0 0.3. But you also see a peak here at 0.1, which suggests that there's a subclone. Something is going on here with, with subclonality, the peaks at 0.1 or 0.2. Uh, and, and interestingly now, if you look at the, the different mutations, you can see the PIK3CA mutation occurs in 0.4. So it's in this peak. To me, that suggests it's clonal, as is the cyclin D1 mutation and the ARID1A mutation. But then some of the other mutations, like the NRAS and the KRAS, are in the other peak. They're at 0.2, which to me suggests that they're subclonal. And a perfectly valid explanation, we don't know for sure, but uh, an explanation in this case could be that there are two subclones here. One is NRAS mutant and one is KRAS mutant. Those two, uh, two mutations evolved separately in different cells and now the tumor basically has two slightly different subpopulations that are evolving uh, alongside each other. Um, so with a little bit of detective work, looking at available um, mutation frequency data, uh, you can get at that a little bit. Good. Any any other questions that I can answer? Maybe I uh, can use the remaining time to show another feature. Um, so actually, I showed you earlier. Um, I went to. I said I was a little scared to do this, but I went to the Genie 8.1 public cohort. If you wanted to recreate the cholangiocarcinoma subset that I created, you could start from this page, you could go to the cancer type detailed, and then look for cholangiocarcinoma. And you can see um, different uh, um, numbers here. So I think actually the cohort I showed you was probably a little out of date because we now have more. So if you want to be certain that you're looking at just intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, you could look, you could select these 554. Uh, you can see now that the portal is, is updating. It's, it's, it's cranking and it's trying to figure out mutation frequencies. Um, and uh, if you wanted to be, to exclude extrahepatic, you could uh, include that here. And then for some tumor types, we just don't have the distinction between intrahepatic and extrahepatic. Um, but, what I showed you earlier, and I did this to sort of remove a little bit of the, the messiness of the different gene panels that 
that come with Genie. So not every center in Genie uses the same gene panel. Uh, so that's why I actually limited it to the to the MSK cases. So I can do that here and get the get the MSK cases. But now you've basically recreated what I generated earlier. You could now add a few more tumors, either extra hepatic or or non not otherwise specified. Uh, but you could take these and you can get a bookmark link for for this filter um, uh, and send it to somebody else or s save it at a virtual study in your own list of studies which is actually what i did and then they show up on your on your cbio portal homepage, and you can come back to them and and, and work with them so that's 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 what i did uh, in this case so if you wanted to you can actually um what i wanted to show you is one simple feature. If you wanted to, for example, to simply ask, are there any differences here between primary and metastatic tumors? You could, you can just click this. I, don't know, I think I may have to select them first. Um, you can compare those two. Second. loading. Oops, now I removed, <laughs> accidentally removed the charts. I'm teaching you how to add a chart back in, so that it's also good. Um, here it is, and I can just, I can hit compare uh, on this, and what the portal now does is it takes the two groups and simply compares them. Um, it, with respect to any available clinical parameters. Um, obviously, sample type will show up. But for example, fraction genome altered now shows up as a, as a um, if you want the primaries on the left, you can drag it over. Um, and to me, maybe somewhat surprisingly, um, the primary tumors have a slightly higher degree of copy number burden as measured by FGA. Nothing else is significantly different. Uh, mutation count is roughly the same on average, uh, but in, in mutation space and copy number space, we can look for differences now. And I didn't prepare this, so I don't know if I'm, this is actually an interesting example or not. Um, if you only want to see significant changes, there's nothing that's significant, but there might be some that are trending towards significance. For example, you can see that there are, if you wanted to know if there's anything enriched in metastasis, you could select metastasis here, uh, and you can see there are a lot of genes that are more frequently mutated in metastatic samples. It counts are low, but for example, KRAS is mutated in just seven percent of primary tumors, and then but but double the percentage in metastatic tumors, sixteen percent. Uh, it's it's not significant. It's significant if you look at it at one gene at a time. But once you correct for all the different tests that we did, it's no longer. Significant. Significant, but you'd probably go with this. My gut would tell me, yeah, this is this is interesting. Same for RARA, same for SMAT4, um, although some of the numbers here are lower. P53 is, is actually uh, is also higher, 23% versus 17%. Um, but you, you get the idea here of, of what you can do with this kind of tool. Um, should CBIO portal be cited? Maybe that's the last question before we wrap up. Yes, we would appreciate it if you keep Citing CBIO portal at the top of uh, the homepage of any of the CBIO portals. We actually ask you to cite it. Actually, um, we, if you use ACR data, which you can, you should cite that manuscript. But if you use the CBIO portal in general, it would be nice if you use, if you cite either or both of these um, primary manuscripts. And then if you're interested in following us on Twitter, we have a, a Twitter account that is fairly low frequency, so won't be. Too much noise, but if you're interested, you can um, you can follow us on on Twitter. All right, and I think with that, I can maybe show my acknowledgement slide and acknowledge all the different centers that are actively involved in CBIO portal um, development. Uh, acknowledge MSK for their support, and then all the different funders, present and past. Thank you.